As I keep looking at this, and I keep thinking it's beef, but you're adding what I think of as pork seasonings. Yes. The rosemary and the garlic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, I'm just going to make them into rough burgers again. A wild, it's a wild boar, it's a rugged animal. Nothing neat about it, in my opinion. A couple of minutes each side, that's all we need with that. Don't be afraid of trying game. It's a bit different from an everyday meat, but I love its deep, distinct flavour. When you smell them cooking, there is no doubt that this is game. Yes, absolutely. There is that yep. rich, almost woodsy note yep. of game meat. Yep. Oh, look at that. Look at that. This will be the first time I've ever eaten a wild boar burger. Rough looking and rustic with just three ingredients, it couldn't be simpler. It might be an unusual meat, but the fact it was raised just down the road is wonderful. That is probably the most handsome burger I've ever seen. It's pretty. I hope you're not expecting me to eat this elegantly. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. There's no way, elegant way of eating a burger. Isn't that good? Perfect. It's kind of quite wild flavours. Yes, yeah. It's not too harsh. No. Masses of flavour. Mm. It's a good burger, Tom. Good burger. The wild boar meat is simply sensational. If you want to try it, look in farm shops, delis or good butchers. Get the details on our website, along with more ideas for how you can experiment yourself. It's all too easy to be a little bit dismissive of things we don't know and understand. And that includes the vegetable world. I never knew how to treat kohlrabi. I know they're very beautiful vegetables, very unusual to look at, but I really didn't know what to do with them. I might have even been a little bit rude about them. You might not have come across kohlrabi. The name literally means cabbage turnip, but they're actually more sweet and juicy, which makes them perfect to pair with some more familiar fruit and veg in a delicious winter coleslaw. Pale green kohlrabi looks amazing with these thin slices of white and pink grapefruit. If you're not a grapefruit fan, you could use a large tangy orange instead. Now a little dressing. I need a squeeze of lemon juice and some salty capers. And then also in there, just a little bit of olive oil. I want this salad to be full of crunch. I want it to invigorate and surprise. So I'm just going to put together a simple, luscious topping. I'm putting in some little spring onions, very finely sliced. I've got a tiny bit of garlic in there as well. I only use garlic raw if it's very juicy and fresh looking. So a few slivers of that. And then some yoghurt. This creamy yoghurt would be great as part of any crunchy salad. But I'm going to try it with another underused veg. I think I'd seen celeriac sitting around in the greengrocers for years. I didn't know what it was. There's something very cleansing about the smell of celeriac. This is the sort of salad that I'd eat when I had a hangover, or maybe if I'd eaten too much the day before. Celeriac browns quite quickly when you cut it, so it's worth having a lemon on hand just to squeeze over it. I think the salad could do with some more fresh parsley. It's a lovely grounding effect on a dish. Brings it back to earth. But quite a few things that are either new to me or things I don't use very often. So there's something in there that I know really well, and that's beetroot. Add a little olive oil to the yoghurt mixture Toss together with the grated veg, and you're ready to assemble the salad. On to here. You know, I do love soothing food with familiar flavours. 
I also like things that startle and excite. It's crisp and it's crunchy and it's got that sourness to it as well. And it's delicious. It's a new fresh salad and I love it. I spent much too long ignoring our more unusual vegetables. This dazzling dish just reminds me of how versatile and full of flavour they are, both raw and cooked. Kohlrabi and celeriac, give them a chance. They might just end up as a regular treat. I'm at Thornbridge Hall in Derbyshire with wild boar farmer Tom Clark. Earlier, Tom introduced me to something new with his tasty boar burger. So I want to cook something just as interesting and wonderful for him. This impressive kitchen garden is bound to provide me with the wonderful bit. And even at this time of year, there's still an amazing amount going on. Yeah. I love these. This to me looks like what I call purple Russian. And at the top of the plant, they're really tender. I can't resist this. Cavalonero, black cabbage. So can I nick some of the, the tiny little yeah. sprouts here? So what's the difference then, Nigel, other than the, uh, the purple, the, the green sprout? Not a lot in terms of flavour. But what I like about them is that they look so pretty on the plate. Yeah. It's actually looking quite good. It's looking rather healthy. Yes, it's looking very healthy. <laughs> so now I've got my wonderful veg, I need something weird to go with them. I've got a recipe idea that could make use of the estate's homegrown beer. So Jim Harrison, the brains behind the brewery, has bought me a few to choose from. We've got a, quite a selection here, um, running from uh, a wheat beer to beautifully hopped, light-coloured beers. Oh, that's what I want. Oh. But I'm after something very light and fresh tasting to make a very crisp, light batter. That's your man. That'll, uh, that'll fit the bill perfectly. Lovely. While Jim heads back to some more brewing, I'm joining Tom to make a start on the veg that we picked in the garden. So I want a very light batter to cling to these, because they're so delicate. Yeah. Although their flavours are quite strong. So a little bit of flour to that, and pop in an egg yolk. That will help bind it together, would it? Yeah, yeah. just make it just that little bit richer. I often use wine in my cooking, but I rarely get the chance to cook with beer. But this batter gives me the perfect excuse to open a bottle. You feel it's light on the whisk. Yep. And it doesn't matter if it's got lumps in. It doesn't make any difference at all. The beer should give me a lovely light batter. You could use it to experiment with other types of veg, or a bit of fish. I mean, traditionally, you wouldn't use a beer batter for tempura, but I think that the beer with the, the cabbage leaves will be amazing. Yes. The leaves will only need a few minutes to cook until the batter is light and crisp. I mean, this is slightly experimental. I want to try some of these little sprouts. I have to say, I've never deep fried a sprout before. In my opinion, it makes it more interesting, so I'm not a sprout lover. Oh, you're not a sprout lover? No, Christmas Day only, that's it. People who don't like the veg, it's a good, fun, exciting way of eating them, I think. I've never tried the tempura batter on the veg before. It's certainly not on sprouts. No. These crisp vegetables are crying out for a dip, so I'm just making a very quick one with fresh orange, lemon juice, and soy sauce. So what do you fancy then? I'm going to try a sprout. Go straight in there, I think. All right. Dip it in. It doesn't taste like a sprout. It's sweeter. Sweet right. with the sharpness of the dip. And you can actually taste the beer in the batter, which I didn't actually think you would. As well as the sharpness of, of the dip, you can tell there's beer. I mean, that's quite exciting to me. Yeah. The sour, sweet dip, and then these sort of earthy greens. So it's a hit with Tom, no, even the no, sprouts. No, no, no. But what will Jim think of what I've done with his beer? Can I dip it in here? Yeah, dip it into the, the citrus and soy. Mmm, beautiful. Crunchy, eh? Mm, very crunchy, it's fantastic, isn't it? Marvellous. Thank you very much. And it does seem to work. It's that lightness of the batter that I think that was the right, the right, the right beer worked really well, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. I could keep eating that all day long. Beautiful. We all know that fish is great in a batter, but I found the same is even true of a sprout. It just goes to show what could happen 
if you experiment a little. Sometimes things really take you by surprise. I remember ordering bread and butter pudding once and thinking I was on very safe ground. But I got something very surprising. A traditional bread and butter pudding is full of wonderful spices and coconut milk. Although it was a dish I recognised and was very happy to eat, it just came with this wonderful variation and I've never forgotten it. You might think that something as classic as good old bread and butter pudding can't be improved on, but trust me, a few aromatic spices and some rich coconut milk will transform a familiar dish into something new and wonderful. I'm starting by making the custard base. I need egg yolks and some coconut milk. It's got a richness to it that will work very, very nicely with the spices. And some ordinary milk. Now the reason that this pudding was so wonderful was because of the sweet spices. They were unexpected and the first one that went in was vanilla. Now you can use vanilla extract but I quite like using a whole pod. I just scrape some of the seeds out drop them into the custard. I'm going to put the split pod in there as well because you'll get masses of flavour in there. The next spice to go in is possibly my favourite of all. If I could only take one spice to my desert island, it would be cardamom. There's something magical about the smell of this stuff. It's a warming smell. Then there's this hit of the exotic about it. Cinnamon's the last spice to go in, and some sugar. I'm using muscovado as it's got a rich butterscotch flavour. There are so many breads that you can use in this pudding. I think I've used every bread there is, including hot cross buns, and they've all been delicious. Spread the bread with some soft butter. How you arrange the slices is up to you, but I do think it's nice to cut the crusts off. Just on the top, a little bit of demerara sugar. Sometimes I feel I could cook just for the smell of cooking alone. And this is one of those moments. Have the oven quite low, so the custard bakes slowly. As a treat, I want to make a caramelised banana topping to go with my pud. You'll need two or three quite firm fruits. Cook them slowly in butter with a generous sprinkle of sugar. So once the bananas are sizzling and starting to brown a little bit, they're going to get a bit of grated orange zest. It's simply just that last bit of freshness with something that is homely and warm and baked. Just that little zip to bring the whole thing to life. If you shake the pan, you'll see when it's ready, because it quivers slightly, almost blancmange-like. So I've got toasted bread, quivering sweet spicy custard, and a bit of fried banana. It's just the smell of the sweetness and the spice. It's like you've opened up a whole spice cupboard. But then you've got this back note of this lovely, sweet butterscotch sugar. It really is gorgeous. It's blissful. Adding the coconut milk is a brilliant way to ring the changes with such a familiar pudding. What else you add is up to you. Favourite spices, dried fruits, whatever takes your fancy. The caramelised bananas would make a really lovely topping for ice cream too, if you don't have time to make the pud.
In this series, I've tried lots of different food combinations. You'll find all the recipes on the website. There are so many other perfect pairings still out there to explore. It's really fired my imagination. I hope it has for you, too.